Okay. Um, I, I thought John had an announcement. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Jackie Wise Rhodes to our class for this Sunday and next Sunday. Uh, most of you may remember that she met with us last December to report on a symposium of Mennonite and Jewish scholars entitled Jews and Mennonites Reading the Bible After the Holocaust. Somewhat in passing, she mentioned how in her studies she fell in love with the Hebrew Bible. At least that's the way I remember the comment. And I was intrigued by the comment, and she clarified for me that she was talking about the Old Testament in general, just the first five books. I noted how some speakers to our class and some class members have in the past spoken of having difficulty loving the God that seems to be portrayed in parts, at least, of the Old Testament. But she's generously accepted the invitation to return to our class and elaborate on that comment. Um, Jackie, academic background includes Highland College, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, Free University of Amsterdam, and a doctorate from Emory University. She taught at Bluffton College for seven, seven and a half years, and she joined the UNBS teaching faculty in July 2022. She's taught courses on the Old Testament, New Testament, methods of biblical interpretation, and introductory Greek and Hebrew, among other things. Sounds like an industry will sign courses at Goshen College covering the entire waterfront. Jackie, thanks so much for coming back and meeting with us again. We look forward. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. How is the sound? Is this good? Folks on Zoom, let us know how it sounds. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you to talk about one of my very favorite topics, um, why I love the Old Testament. That was my assignment. That was my topic that was given to me, and I was so happy to be asked to talk about this. And I'm even happier that I get two weeks um, because it would feel pretty impossible and to, to do it in one week. And what I um, am planning to do is to take this topic, why I love the Old Testament, and to break it down. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about me, who I am, the I part, and a little bit about the Old Testament. What do we think of when we think of Old Testament? And maybe a little bit of a 10-minute intro Old Testament lesson that might be review for many of you, but I'm hoping that it will be helpful. Everything okay? Okay. Um, and then next week, I want to focus on the love part. Why do I love the Old Testament? Although we're going to hint at some of it and, and, and start talking about that today as well. In fact, I want to start by just giving you my current top nine reasons I love the Old Testament. I have them on note cards. And by next week, there might be 10, there might be 12, but this is what I have right now. And for next week, I will put these all on slides so that we can revisit them. But for now, I just want to share them with you verbally. I love the Old Testament because love of God is at its heart and soul. I know that wrestling with the Old Testament for um, in Christian communities I've been a part of is often about is about struggling to find the loving God we know in the pages of the Old Testament, well, I have discovered that that is the beating heart of the Old Testament itself. It is there. And it's our, um, sometimes it's our interpretive lenses that get in the way of us encountering that. So I will return to this. I love the Old Testament because reading it is a cross-cultural and intercultural experience. Um, it is old. Not only is it old, it was assembled over a long period of time, written by many people from many different cultures, and it has been interpreted for the past two to more than 2,000 years by intercultural interpreters who are our cloud of witnesses as we interpret today. 
I love the Old Testament because it surprises me still, even after all these years, even after I, even 25 years after I first started learning Hebrew. I love the Old Testament because I have come to discover for myself that I don't have to love every single story to engage with it authentically and to love it as a collection. I love the Old Testament because it connects me with thousands of years of interpreters. I mentioned this, a cloud of witnesses. In this way, the Old Testament, even though it is in some ways one people's story, the people of Israel, it has become the story of many, of multitudes, right? And that potentiality for um, a more universal scope of its story, I think is in the, the Old Testament itself. It's not just the New Testament that, that creates that pathway. It is within the pages of the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because it gives Christians shared scripture with Jews and shared traditions with Muslims. And I think that's really powerful. I love the Old Testament because it serves as a witness to one tiny people group's resilience in the face of the worst thing they could imagine coming true. I've been doing some reading about scholars, from scholars who are lifting up how remarkable it is that this tiny nation of Israelites and Judahites, after being completely conquered, their temple destroyed, chose to maintain their religious and cultural traditions through writing in a way that sustained has sustained itself over thousands of years. Many other tiny little nations were conquered and they did not make the same choice. If they did, their, their writings did not survive in the, number, um, in the number that the ancient Israelites did. That they made that choice to maintain their identity in a different way is really powerful. They didn't simply say, well, and this is something they could have chosen. They could have said, well, our God has been conquered by the Babylonian God. I guess we'll follow the Babylonian God now, which was kind of how, how things happened when people were conquered. That was a normal thing to think and do. But their idea of covenant with their God led them to a different way. And as a result, we have still today the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because of its literary diversity. You want a love poem? We got one, right? You want some exciting narratives with surprise endings? We've got a bunch. Do you, do you need to find prayers? Do you need to find laments that call out to God in the midst of distress? We have it. Are you struggling with ex an ex existential crisis? What is the meaning of life in the face of death? We've got it, right? We, it's, it's just stunning literary diversity. And that is one reason I love it. I also love it, this is my last reason for today. I love the Old Testament because its characters are humans, not heroes. And I think one of the reasons that we struggle, at least I did, I have in the past, we struggle with evaluating the behavior of some of the characters in the Bible and just seeing these characters behave very badly. And sometimes it's because we have a modern frame of reference, right? And different worldviews and expectations. But sometimes even according to the ancient expectations, people are just making bad choices, right? Um, and they're humans. And these are complicated human stories. I think we get in trouble when we think that every character in the Bible um, has to in some way be a model for our own behavior. Instead, these stories are describing um, describing these um, important, important cultural memories or narratives that have been passed down through the ages that are important for different reasons than just giving us a model to follow. So these are nine reasons that I love the Old Testament. And I invite your reaction and reflection. Um, and again, I'm going to be putting these on slides and we'll return to them next week. But I do have a timer set on my watch so that we will have time for some conversation today as well. Why do I love the Old Testament? Um, I want to start by inviting you to reflect on a question. 
the Bible and I are like. How would you finish this? And I, I give you some options that you can completely reject, right? None of these have to be true for you. But they are some things I thought of how you might answer this question in your journey. And this, you might answer this question in very different ways from year to year and decade to decade of our lives, right? Do you feel like you're two peas in a pod? Do you, do you wrestle or dance together? Are you friends holding hands? Are you somewhat estranged but still family? Do you feel kind of wary, like the Bible is a, a dangerous stranger? Are you adversaries? You'd have a good uh, biblical model for that in Jacob, right? An adversary wrestling with the angel. Are you wrestling in that sort of adversarial way? Are you a student and a teacher? Is there another metaphor that comes to mind? Does anyone have a metaphor that popped into their head that they'd like to shout out and I'll repeat it? If not, I'll come back to this at the end. Something like this needs some time. So sit with this. When we go to our, come to our discussion at the end, this is one of the things I will invite you to share. The Bible and I are like. Well, at this point in my life, I think I would answer the question, um, I think I would be drawn to the dancing metaphor, that the Bible and I are like dance partners. Um, Although in, in the past, the wrestling metaphor has been very uh, powerful for me as well. And so who am I? As I'm talking about my love for the Bible, I just want to share a little bit about who I am with some pictures. This is me as about a six-year-old. This is probably 1981 um, with my first cat that I named. I've always been an animal person. I live in Goshen with a spouse, three cats and a dog today. Um, and this was Cuddles, the first cat I named, Cuddles, who had, who was blind in one eye, as you might be able to see. And she lived on the farm, an outdoor cat. I grew up on a farm in Archbold, outside of Archbold, Ohio. And I went to the same school in my life, graduated in 1993, and um, went to college. I, I did not choose a Mennonite college because at that time, I was going through my little rebellion when I was 18 was that everyone I knew from Archibald was going to a Mennonite college. I wanted to go somewhere different. That probably had advantages and disadvantages for me. I think looking back, I would have been perfectly happy at Goshen, but I had a great time at this Disciples of Christ College I chose. And this is me in college. It, it, that, at that time, I was studying English and writing, minoring in music. I was thinking about my future as a possible English professor or writer, I wasn't thinking about religious studies at all until I started hanging out with two of my friends who were religion majors, and we started having the best conversations. And by the time I was in my senior year, I was um, a TA for a class taught by a religion professor, and I said, hey, if I'm kind of interested in going into the academic study of religion or in studying theology or Bible, what should I do? And he said, you should go to your denominational seminary and then go from there. And I said, that is great advice. And so uh, I took a year and a half to make this decision for sure. But after living back in Archbold for a year and a half and writing for the local newspaper, I went to AMBS. So this is me in the middle um, with two of my housemates at AMBS, two people that still live and, and work, and work in, in, the, in Elkhart and Goshen. And this is us probably in the year 2020, I'm sorry, 2001 or 2002. Um, and that was me the, thus almost 25 years ago at seminary. And then this is me today um, on the AMBS website. So what happened between that picture of me going to seminary, trying to figure out what this pull was toward the study of the Bible and theology when I was an English major, right? I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to do this. What is the story of my story between that time and today? Um, well, in order to tell that story, and I might have mentioned this when I talked in December, but I'll, 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 I'll tell the story in a little more detail now. I had an encounter with the Old Testament when I was learning Hebrew I mean, I'm going to be clear. I immediately was drawn to my biblical languages classes and my New Testament and Old Testament classes. I immediately knew that I wanted to take as many of them as possible. But it was when I was taking a Hebrew exegesis class in the book of Genesis that um, 
I first started considering that maybe maybe going on and devoting my life to the study of the Bible by by pursuing pursuing further graduate work might be the path I would choose or I would be called to choose. And it was the story of Genesis 22. So this is one of those stories that I wrestled with. I felt repelled by it. This is Genesis 22 when God tests Abraham, if you'll remember. Those are the first words of the story. And God tested Abraham by saying, take your son to the top of this mountain and sacrifice him to me. This was, I found this difficult. I found it, I was repelled by it. Uh, the image of God, even if God always knew that Abraham was going to be faithful and would be rescued and it wouldn't really happen, to put someone through that psychologically, I just couldn't fathom it. And because this is how my personality works, I decided that I had such strong, feeling, such strong feelings about the story that I was going to write my big project on it for that semester. Um, and so I did. I wrote, I read it in Hebrew, I analyzed it, I tried to figure out what was going on, why was the story so powerful and meaningful to so many people over the years, why had it been preserved? This is, by the way, an image of the story by Marc Chagall, um, a 20th century Jewish artist from 1966. Even though he is Jewish, many of his pieces of art also feature images from the crucifixion of Jesus, um, which is super interesting to me. And people have written about why, as a Jew, he was drawn to, to including that. You can see in the upper right-hand corner the image of, um, of Jesus carrying his cross. But anyway, I was working with this story with all my objections, with all my anger, with all my worry about the image of God this story was handing to us. And in the, in, in, in the process of writing this paper, I had what I can only describe as a sort of spiritual or mystical experience of being welcomed by a text that I had thought to be hostile. This text, it was because of it was because of Hebrew grammar, which is so weird, but it's because the way the story was structured, it was just like, action, 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 and then it would pause for some dialogue. Action, action, action. And it didn't tell me what any, anyone was thinking. It didn't tell me what anyone was feeling. I had to fill in those gaps for myself. And because of that, there was space for my objections, for my anger, for my outrage, there was space for it to enter into the story. So this story welcomed me and it didn't make me change. I mean, sometimes the Bible asks us to change. It's true. But this story did not ask me to change. It said, come as you are, come with your objections, come with your, um, with your rage about the story. You're welcome here. Let's have a conversation. And that changed me. And I went and had a conversation with my professor, Ben Olenberger, about it, and he said, well, you should take this seriously. Maybe maybe this is guiding you toward, toward a future in a PhD program. Um, or I think I brought it up, and he, like, he, didn't, he didn't interpret it for me. I brought it up, and he, and he affirmed that that was something to think about. So this was one of the pretty important moments for me at AMBS, which is one reason I'm so thrilled to be back teaching there. It was um, one of the most important periods of my life, my formation there. Um, and this was among the most important. And so I graduated from AMBS um, thinking, well, maybe this is, maybe this is what I want to do. But I always take a long time to make decisions. And I also had other stuff I wanted to do. And so before I, I made the final decision to apply to PhD programs, I went to the Netherlands with Mennonite Mission Network, where I lived for five years, worked in a house of hospitality that was sponsored by the Dutch Mennonites. Um, it was a collaborative project between Mennonite Mission Network and the Dutch Mennonite Mission Board. And I had done a, an internship in Chicago, an urban uh, community development kind of internship when I was at AMBS. And this was kind of an extension of that interest into community work, into presence as a kind of ministry that is profoundly um, needed in, in, in our often individualistic, fragmented communities. And it was wonderful. I loved it. And um, 
And for a minute, I wondered if, if uh, for more than a minute, I wondered if maybe living and working in the Netherlands was where my life was headed long term. But this idea about studying the Old Testament, studying the Hebrew Bible, and returning to teaching that that subject matter stayed in my mind until it just emerged as where I felt I was being called to take the next step. And so my fifth year, I, I went to the Free University of Amsterdam and did a one-year program where I kind of refreshed my Hebrew because I hadn't been spending a lot of time with it for those first four years. I was worried about learning Dutch, right? Um, and I discerned about if I do a PhD, do I want to do it here? Do I want to return to the States? So I applied to programs while I was there, ended up discerning that returning to the States was, um, was the path that was right for me. Went to Emory for my PhD, where I met my uh, spouse, Brandon. My first job was at Bluffton, and then I came here to AMBS. At each of these places, um, I was formed in ways that still affect me. AMBS was where I encountered biblical languages and literary methods of reading the Bible. Um, had profound influence on me. In the Netherlands, as I said, learning about the ministry of presence, of just being with people where they are um, without an agenda and listening, um, truly listening to their life stories. And that in and of itself being an invitation to um, connection with one another and with God. At the Free University of Amsterdam, I took some classes about putting ordinary readings um, of the Bible in conversation with scholarly readings. And I kind of learned how those barriers can tend to break down in really helpful ways. I still am thinking about this a lot. In, at Emory, I learned to, to put my love of the Old Testament in conversation with the its, its culture and context and all the literature around the Bible um, that wasn't canonized, that my dissertation um, explored that literature. At Bluffton, I became a teacher scholar, and I taught a lot, um, and I learned that my teaching identity and my scholar identity um, need each other. Um, and at AMBS, I'm still discovering what this is going to mean for me. Um, but one of the things I'm doing is transitioning from teaching the Bible in a liberal arts context to teaching in theological education, which gives me more opportunities to teach in church contexts like this, which I'm really, really loving and enjoying. I think I will stop there with, with who am I. And I'm actually going to switch 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 slide decks. Um, that's a little bit of me and how I fell in love with the Bible. Um, and I'm 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 aware that it's 11:27, so I'm going to take about eight minutes to do a little micro introduction to the Old Testament, and then we're going to open it up for conversation. Um, Let's see. Oh, well, excuse me. I just have to go really fast. There we go. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you're able to read this very well. The colors might not be the best. But um, for those of you watching on Zoom, you can probably see this a little better. But I will be zooming in. I will be zooming in. So don't worry if you can't read every, every word. Um, I just want to remind us, when we say Old Testament, what are we saying? Like, what are we referring to? Um, and one thing I do with my students is just talk about naming, right? Um, Old Testament and New Testament, right? These are sort of the traditional Christian names for the two parts of our Bible. Some, some folks like to call it First and Second Testament because old has this connotation of being like outdated or irrelevant, right? When actually the New Testament is also pretty old. Right, 2,000 years. Um, but there is a sort of chronology, right? The, the Old Testament did come together first, and the New Testament did come together second. Um, there's also, if you're Catholic or Orthodox, there are books that are in neither called the Apocrypha or Deuterocanonical books. So it's also good to think about, okay, our canons differ depending on our community. What about if you're Jewish? Well, then Old Testament doesn't really make sense because actually when Jews talk about the Bible, they mean what Christians say when we say Old Testament, right? So scholars often say Hebrew Bible, which is what I said in December that led to this 
led to this invitation, um, because most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And Hebrew Bible is kind of a neutral term that is descriptive, right? And so in scholarly circles, when I go to my academic meetings, that's often the language we use, unless you're explicitly interpreting um, the Hebrew scriptures within the context of the Christian scriptures as a whole, then you'll find people that still talk about Old Testament at these scholarly meetings. Um, but within a Jewish confessional setting, if, if Jews say the Bible, they mean what, what Christians mean when we say Old Testament, but they might also call it Tanakh, right? Which is an acronym for the three parts of the Jewish Bible, the Torah, the Nevi'im, Hebrew for prophets, and the Ketuvim for writings. And so the first part of the Jewish Bible, the Torah, is what Christians usually call the Pentateuch. And this is um, a multivalent term, right, that can refer to the first five books of the Bible as a collection or to individual instructions or laws or that, co that collection. So Torah also means instruction in Hebrew, often translated as law. Um, but it's not just legal material. It's also instructions about... Um, sacrifices, instructions about um, ethically, like how to live ethically as a community, instructions about like the Ten Commandments is, a, is part of this instruction. Love your neighbor, love your love the foreigner among you. All of that are, are instructions according to um, this word Torah, right? And Torah is, um, is what is, I would say, the center of Jewish interpretive practice. If Anabaptists tend sometimes to interpret their Bible through the lens of the figure of Jesus, and Anabaptists specifically through the lens of the Sermon on the Mount, Jews tend to interpret their Bible through the lens of Torah, right? Um, and Torah is five books, right? I'm not, I'm not going to, I'll show these slides with you so you can read every word. I'm not going to read every word. But Torah is the first five books, Pentateuch, five scrolls is what we also call it. The Torah didn't come together all at once, right? And this is actually a model for the entire Bible, um, especially the, the Hebrew scriptures. Torah came together gradually over hundreds um, of years, if not a thousand years. So the traditions, there were what we might think of as campfire stories, traditions about creation, traditions about the first Israelites, um, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, or who is not an Israelite, but in that family. Um, these, some of these traditions were written down. Um, eventually, these different stories were documented together, gathered together by scribes saying, hey, we should have a collection of stories about Abraham. What stories do we have? Scribes collecting together oral traditions, maybe some written documents. These were edited together into what we now have as our biblical text. But we know from the archaeological evidence that that we can't we can't really go back in time three we can't go back in time three thousand or twenty five hundred years and find any scroll that is our book of Genesis. Like the oldest stuff we have is the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of, some of the biblical books preserved there are very similar to what we have, and some are very different. So we know, for example, there were two different versions of the book of Jeremiah, um, one quite short and one longer. We have the longer one in our Bible. Um, the shorter one is in the, the Greek scriptures. And so there were different versions of these of these collections that that were that were valued and copied by different communities. And and so we know that our, our Bible is, is one end result of, of, this, of this very complicated process, right? And it's the, the end result, and, and the Hebrew scriptures have stayed remarkably stable over the past 1,500 years, but there is a thousand-year process of getting to the Bible that we have today. Um, and as, if we put the Bible story in conversation with the story the Bible tells, right? So the, the Bible tells a story about the history of Israel, but we also have the story of how the Bible became a book. And, and so these are two different stories that, that interact, right? And if we look at the story the Bible tells, we have Israel emerging as a people, 1250 to 1000 BCE. But it's not until 700 or 600 that the Torah may, began to emerge as a written document. Parts of it earlier, right? Parts of it earlier, but, but Torah as a collection. Hundreds of years passed during which the stories of Torah were mostly 
orally passed along. And it wasn't until sometime during the period when the second temple stood. So the first temple was destroyed by Babylon. There was the time of exile. Second temple was built when the Persian emperor invited people to do that. And it was still standing during the time of Jesus, but destroyed soon, um, 40 years after Jesus' death by the Romans. Sometime during that five to 600 years, we have Torah in the form or close to the form that we read it today. But it was a long process in getting there. So I'm not gonna go through the rest of these. I have, in my slides, I have examples about the prophets, how did they come to be a collection, the writings, what's different. Happy to share these slides with you and you can look at them yourself. But the, the main point is when I say the Old Testament, you know, we are looking at something that we see as a fixed part of our Bible between two covers, right, with books that are in a certain order. And if, if you like put all your Bibles on a table, we could all look at um, Isaiah 1, and as long as we had the same translation, they would match up perfectly, right? The footnotes would be different, but the text would be the same. If everybody had a different translation, then of course it would differ slightly. But um, but really, reading multiple translations of the same text in the Hebrew Bible is a good way to, to start to realize, oh, ancient people, also there were also multiple versions of these traditions and stories that were alive and treasured and passed along by different communities. Um, and so this is what we, so when we think of the Hebrew Bible, we have this, we have this document with this history behind it, right? It didn't just emerge like we have it today. And I'm going to open it up for questions soon. Um, but one thing I want to say, I want to go back to my reason for loving the Old Testament because it's a witness to one people's resilience. Um, I think one reason, like we're going to talk next week about stories in particular that are so hard to read, that contain such violence and where God gives instructions that that are that we're horrified by, right? That are violent instructions about how to deal with other people. And like, I'm gonna face that and talk with you about it next week. I'm not gonna pretend that's not there. But I also want to suggest that who preserved these stories matters, right? And so when these stories are the record, like imagine you are, imagine that you're a, a, someone who lives in the south of, of Israel, which was called Judah. Imagine that your family was displaced, your temple was destroyed. You no longer have a king. You no longer have a place to offer sacrifices to your God, which is the way that you were taught you're supposed to worship God. Imagine that you are displaced. You are in another part of this Babylonian empire. All of your hopes that this covenant with God, that God would always be with you, that you would always have a king that was in the line of David, that this was what you counted on, this was all gone. And imagine that in that time period, your scribes were writing your history. What kind of a history would speak to you, would give you hope in that context? Would it be a history in which you remembered the times when your people, at least in, your, in, in the way that the stories were told and passed down, that your people were the winners, that your people were the ones who, um, where things were going well for them. But also, lots of times things didn't go well for the Israelites, right? And so, and so think, about, think about what telling that complicated story in this time when the very worst thing possible had happened to you how that would work on your soul, how that would offer you possibilities for imagining a time when maybe, maybe there could be a future that was full of hope. Maybe this wasn't the end of your story. Maybe there was a way that you could wait on God to rescue you that was meaningful, that would preserve your identity. The stories, especially about conquering other people, to me, ring differently in my ears when I imagine a conquered people group with no power telling these stories about the good old days than when I hear people in power with the biggest army today saying, 
God is on our side, just like God was on the side of the Israelites, right? It rings differently. It means differently. And this is why our interpretive lenses are so important. Again, it doesn't exonerate these texts. It doesn't make them suddenly bastions of peace theology, right? It doesn't save them in that way, but it helps me read them in a way that I think can be more coherent with the, the, the image of God as a God of shalom that I, that I truly believe gets to the heart of, of the God that we follow and the God that we love and the God who loves us and the world. So I'm going to pick up here next week. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And my plan is to go back to my reasons for loving the Old Testament and to give some examples of texts that are difficult and how these reasons help me read them. But if there are other things you would rather that I talk about, please tell me, because I have a week to change my mind on that. Um, we've got maybe five or 10 minutes for questions or comments. And Remember, you can go back to the Bible and I are like and share that if you want to. <clears throat> to what extent did the children of Israel, uh, were they influenced by their culture in terms of uh, stories or um, other things that may have influenced their scriptures, like the, the story of creation and some of the ancient stories. Yes. So the question is, was Israel influenced by their neighbors and other cultures around them in the way that they told their stories and what, and what stories they told? This is a hotly debated issue that it has been for 100 years in the world of scholarship. And I think that, um, that the pendulum swings, right? Um, at one point, a lot of of scholars, particularly Christian scholars, were saying, no, we're going to emphasize all the ways that Israel's creation story was different from the Babylonian creation stories. And look, God created with speech in Genesis 1, and there wasn't a battle among the gods where God was conquered and slaughtered, and people were created from the entrails of that God. Like, look at how different this is. And there's that's true. And then there was a pendulum swing where a lot of scholars were saying, okay, we like we have to also recognize all of these similarities, that there was a shared worldview. Um, in, like, yes, Israel um, had, had this devotion and commitment to Yahweh as their one God, but that didn't mean that they were monotheists like us. Like, for a lot of their history, they thought other gods existed. They just didn't worship them, right? Moabites had their god, Edomites had their god, Yahweh was was Israel's god. And so, and I think that that we need the pendulum to be in the middle, and we we need to allow the ancient Israelites to be their own people who are creative in their um, in their theologizing, creative in the way that they conceive of their relationship with their god, because it is rather astonishing that any societies existed in the ancient world that had a tendency toward monotheism because that wasn't everybody was polythe polytheistic back then it was like weird if you weren't so i think we have to acknowledge how significant that is and i think that the scribes that were writing were educated and they were learning texts from like like they were learning like older babylonian sumerian texts as a part of learning to be literate right and so these things obviously influenced, I think, the way that they wrote. There are some psalms, for instance, that if you take out Yahweh um, as, as, a, as a word, they, they sound almost exactly like these old Ugaritic poems about some of their gods, right? And so was there influence? Absolutely. Um, does that mean that Israel was no different from its neighbors? That's going too far, I think. Hi, Jackie. Um, Hi. I'm Barbara Johnson, and um, I don't know how to frame this question exactly, but I would say that I fall in the line of the wrestler yeah. um, on yes. this particular issue, and I commend you for bringing Chagall's painting to us. Um, I am an art person, but besides that, it shows the conflict, I think, of where I am at yes. with... Um, what would you say the atonement 
theory <laughs> or something. Um, and and how it is that God, through all of this first testament, has people sacrificing for their sins and Abraham doing the thing with his son and then God doing the thing with his son as 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 it states anyway, mm -hmm. as we interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just really kind of wondering if you have any, I don't know, something to say about that. I would, I would appreciate your Absolutely. thoughts. Absolutely. Um, so I think the last time I was here, I, I mentioned that one of my teachers was Perry Yoder. And in 2017, he wrote the Believer's Church Bible Commentary on Leviticus. And one of the things that he was insistent on is that he wasn't going to interpret sacrifices in Leviticus as a as a anticipation of Jesus' death in any way, right? He was taking them on their own terms. And what I learned from Perry when I was a student is that seeing sacrifices in ancient Israel as a way to get your sins forgiven is a simpl oversimplified and very Christian way of thinking about them. People sacrificed for lots of reasons. They sacrificed animals to say thank you. They sacrificed animals to say things are going well. They sacrificed animals because it was Passover and that was what you did. And, and there were sacrifices that were done um, be, to seek um, to seek atonement from sin. But that was one of many rules, just like we pray for all these reasons. We pray to say, I'm sorry, and ask forgiveness. We pray to say, thank you. We pray to say, God, this is how I'm doing. Sacrifice was just as multivalent. And so, and sacrifice didn't magically, I mean, it's not like sacrifice was magic. It was more that somehow in this very different worldview, offering sacrifices, See, see, it wasn't the sin that that was okay. So sometimes, sometimes people did things that were morally wrong, that were sins, and sacrifice was a part of seeking atonement. But sometimes sacrifices were a part of getting back to a state of purity that had nothing to do with sinning, right? So, like, I had a baby that made me impure for a while. I didn't have a baby. I don't have any children. But if I had a baby that made me impure for a while, right? purity was not about sin. It was not about my body being bad. This is just how they thought about human beings. And when, when blood or other fluids were expelled from humans, that resulted in a temporary state of impurity. And maybe a sacrifice was part of getting pure again, because God is pure. And so we got to keep Israel pure so that that relationship keeps flowing unimpeded by impurity. So it's a very weird... I mean, it's very weird, and impurity, impurity is a something that we don't know if other ancient Israelite ancient cultures had, but everybody had sacrificing. It was just the way religion worked. And so I'm going to end by saying interpreting Jesus' death as a sacrifice is a choice, and there are other ways to interpret it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That was like I feel like I just unleashed a fire hose of thoughts at you, so I'm sorry. We can talk more about that if you'd like. Yeah. Jackie, this is Art Smoker. I'm I'm currently uh, finishing the reading of the Martyr's Mirror. Wow, I have never read that. Uh, these, these people, of course, were coming out of the Catholic tradition. Many of the martyrs write long, long letters yeah. to their wives, their brothers and sisters, and they quote extensively from the Apocrypha. They do, yes. And I'm wondering how long the Apocrypha was utilized in the Anabaptist tradition oh, that and is, then it fell away. That is such a good question. I want, you know, Gerald Mast at Bluffton University would know exactly how to answer that. And I'm going to send him an email and get his answer, and I'll give it to you next week. But this is what I think the answer is. I think that Anabaptists continued to use the Apocrypha as long as they were reading the Bible in German, because Martin Luther's translation had the Apocrypha. And I think it was... 
at least for Anabaptists who, I think, I think when people started to use Bibles in non-German languages that were created by Protestant groups that had rejected the Apocrypha, maybe that's when it happened. There was definitely, it didn't happen as early, nearly as early as it did for other Protestant groups. who They rejected the Apocrypha because I, as far as I know, it was because there was this commitment to like, well, the Apocrypha are in Greek and like, they're not, and, and we actually need to use the same Old Testament, like we, like the Jews have their, their Bible that does not contain the Apocrypha, right? So, so the irony is that 2,000 years ago, Christians read the Old Testament in Greek. They read the what was called the Septuagint, and it included the Apocrypha. And almost, partly as a reaction against that, Jews had a renewed commitment to reading the Bible in Hebrew, um, maybe as a differentiation, like the Greek Bible, which had originated as Jewish scripture for Greek-speaking Jews, was becoming the Christian Bible, and so they're like, we need, to, we're gonna, we're, we're making this choice to to go back and emphasize the Hebrew scriptures, and so the Apocrypha weren't in Hebrew; they were written in Greek, and so that dropped away. So some Protestant reformers maybe were like, we got to use the same Bible as the Jews for our Old Testament. It's going to be the Hebrew scriptures. We are following their lead. The stuff that's in Greek, it was always kind of secondarily canonical anyway. We're just not, that's not important, right? And so, but the Anabaptists did not follow in that for, I don't know if it was 100 or 200 years. They're like, at least the first 50 years to, uh, of Anabaptist writings quoted extensively from the Apocrypha. But everything I just said could be a little bit wrong, because I'm talking from the top of my head. So I'm going to email Gerald Nast and get his answer. Thank you. Jackie, the, mic, the microphone is given to me, and so I might as well say a word. <laughs> I, I, I really am fascinated and enjoy hearing you talking about the Old Testament as sort of a major milepost for you. Yeah. Now, my own feeling is, and uh, and this is again, again, uh, if you you take the Old Testament scriptures, they the rabbis did add to it down through the centuries. And so when you read a passage, there might be four or five rabbis yep. that had a different view about that. Absolutely. And, and that was a very important part of the, of the synagogue. Yes. Now, uh, I happen to believe that um, there is a progression in our understanding of God. Mm. And the best understanding we have is Jesus. Mm. That, that's just my biased thought. Sure. If I'd be a Muslim, it would be something different. Right. But that, as I stand in my tradition, Jesus becomes the the best understanding of what God is like. Mm -hmm. And even he said, you have heard of old, but now I say to you. Mm -hmm. And so he's like the rabbis adding something new. I would, so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I would just say another word about that. No, I think, and maybe this is a debatable thing, and I'm not sure where you would stand with this. I think that in reality, God acts in our world today exactly the same way he's always acted in the world. Now, that, that's a, that could be a very radical statement <laughs> because the Bible is full of the statements God said. Yeah. See, and I don't think that God says things. Oh, okay. I think it's a human construct yeah. to prove what they're saying is God saying. And and that's a fascinating way of looking at it. Yeah. But I, I think that um, the best understanding we have of what God is like in our world is through Jesus. And that's a very much of an Anabaptist understanding of the scriptures. It is. Yeah. And and so uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 becomes mm -hmm. sort of the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. But then what do you do with all of these other things where it says God said? In other words, God said to Abraham that you ought to take Isaac and sacrifice him. Mm -hmm. See, I think that's not really God saying that. That's a human construct. And you have to sort of weigh those human constructs in the scripture mm -hmm. against the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That becomes our cornerstone. And so I call that there is the message or the story in the Old Testament, but there's also a counter story. Mm 
-hmm. that is the human construct that makes that counter story. Mm -hmm. Now, the best story we have is the story that Jesus gave. And, and most of the life of Jesus is cast in the gospel accounts over the story of the Old Testament. Yep. So there, there is now, even in the life of Jesus, the way it's, repeat, the way it's talked to us about <laughs> is, is a metaphor for all of the Old Testament that was part of their story. <laughs> like you have going through the waters of a baptism, you have uh, you have going to Mount Tabor <laughs> to meet with the prophets like Mount Sinai. <laughs> you have 40 days in the wilderness, like 40 times uh, all of that, I'm, I'm just illustrating mm -hmm. that the life of Jesus is is cast in light of that ancient story. Yep. And that's part of our task now to weigh those things in the relationship to Jesus. That I, my, yes, thank you. That I what I appreciate, I appreciate many things about what you shared. And one thing I appreciate is that Jesus is the the teachings that we have of Jesus are interacting with his tradition in in his religion and his scriptures in similar ways to other Jewish teachers of the time, right? Jesus is a rabbi interpreting Torah and interpreting scripture for his time and place for his community, right? And as Christians, we have chosen Jesus as our as our teacher, as our rabbi, right? He is our interpretive guide, and we are reading our scriptures with Jesus. That's one way to think about it. Where I find it tricky to say that Jesus is the fullest revelation of God we have, which is a very Anabaptist thing to say. I find it tricky when it comes to interfaith work with Jews. Like, am I, do I really think that because I believe because I believe a certain thing about Jesus' identity, like I have a different opinion theologically about who Jesus was than my Jewish friends do, does that give me access to a truer picture of God than they have? And I'm not comfortable saying yes to that. If you added four Christians, Jesus is, is our truest revelation of God, I would be more comfortable with it. But I think I think God is fully revealed in the Old Testament as well. So I don't think it has to be an either and, an either or. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing that. And I affirm very much how embedded Jesus was as a Jew in his time and place, teaching and interpreting his scriptures in a way that other rabbis were doing as well. And yes, he got in trouble for some of the things he said, right? But do you have a, a response to that? I would I would agree with you, and uh, I I understand the interreligion. Mm -hmm. I I think that this is sort of a radical statement, but I think all religions are a human construct, uh -huh. and in that human construct, Jesus also gave us some. He accepted the Syrophoenician woman, for an example, and and the Samaritan became, and so he reached out beyond his community. Yes, absolutely, and that got him in trouble. And I think we need to also reach out beyond our communities to understand that other people have an insight into the God of the universe. Absolutely. I agree with that. I, I'm not, I see, I happen to believe that Jews don't need to be saved. <laughs> see that we're not, I'm not into Jewish evangelism. In other words, my, my teacher period would say all of the covenants of the Bible are still in place. Like those, yeah. we get it. We have a, we have a covenant through Jesus in the new Testament, but the covenant with Abraham, with the people, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with all creation through Noah, like all of the, those covenants don't just go away. They're not replaced by new covenants. Well, period was a good friend of mine. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 